Everybody's been saying, where has Beast Mode been? <laughs> and that's just the goal with the Sharp Football Analysis Podcast is to discover and uncover new ways to analyze football and then share that information and disseminate that material in an easy to understand manner. And then at that point, all you got to do is let the Marshawn Lynch principle take over. <laughs> yeah, that is when we do it so constantly, so frequently and so repetitively and so accurately, even those who hate analytics, even the cynics and the skeptics, it just will click in their mind that they're so worn down and frustrated. They will have to sit down and listen to reason. And that is the Marshawn Lynch principle. Because like he says, if you just run through somebody's face, a lot of people ain't going to be able to take that over and 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 over again. They're just not going to want that. Think there's a deeper metaphor there? Run through a face. Then you don't have to worry about them no more. Welcome into the week 10 edition of the Sharp Football Analysis Podcast. My name is Warren Sharp from sharpfootballanalysis.com and sharpfootballstats.com. This is the Monday night edition. The game uh, between the Detroit Lions and the Green Bay Packers just ended. And tonight I was unable to do the Sharp Football Show, the live Periscope show that basically is broadcast uh, on my Twitter feed, which you can follow me on Twitter at sharpfootball. Ran into scheduling issue. Uh, Evan Silva also had a scheduling issue. He usually joins me on those, and we just decided let's uh, let's just have me record a podcast late tonight, Monday night, recording this, and we'll get it out there. And he and I will link back up on Friday to record our normal game preview podcast. Let's talk first. Uh, we got a obviously a show that we're going to cover a number of different topics. This is going to be a little bit of a free flowing type show. I'm going to be jumping around here and there, but. First, let's talk about tonight's game when the Green Bay Packers went into Lambeau and got one of their first victories in quite some time against the Green Bay Packers. The biggest takeaway for me in this game was Mike McCarthy's game plan for Brett Hundley. I really did not understand that whatsoever. Um, They had two weeks to prepare. They had just seen what Brett Hundley was capable of doing the prior week with very little time to prepare as the starter against the New Orleans Saints. They tried to run a traditional run-heavy offense, did not have any success. Brett Hundley was terrible in that capacity. The offense in general was terrible as a result. The game was a loss at home. And you figure with two weeks to prepare, they were going to come up with a slightly different game plan, a better way to get some success against the Detroit Lions. Instead, they come up with what appeared to be a very similar game plan from the start. They simply just tried to execute it a little bit better. Um, They were letting Hundley throw the ball a little bit, but everything was short. Um, They were still being somewhat balanced, maybe a little bit less balanced than they were the week before where they were a little bit more run heavy. Um, This time they were between the pass and the run. They were allowing Hundley to throw the ball a little bit more, but everything was short. And after the first uh, game scripting, you know, 15 play calls from Mike McCarthy, you could definitely see that things started to drop off a little bit from an efficiency perspective. Hundley didn't seem as comfortable and the play calls just weren't working out. At halftime, McCarthy indicated that he was indeed trying to get Hundley to throw the ball in the shorter routes. And what you ended up seeing there in the second half was desperation but a much more efficient offense. Now, some of that, obviously, keep in mind that Detroit was playing with a large lead, but in any case, a lot of efficient passing, deeper down the field targets, and especially the no huddle and the up-tempo. And that's one of the things that is shocking to me because that was something Hundley was good at in college at UCLA, something they utilized all the time out there. Why would Mike McCarthy not at least attempt one series between the first or the second series of the game in up-tempo, no-huddle style. 
Why would they wait until the game's completely out of hand? Some quarterbacks are able to feel more comfortable in that. Um, while some guys are a little bit more comfortable in huddling up and taking their time, getting a good read of the defense, other guys just want to get to the line. They think it's an advantage to them. They know the play they're running. Defense has less time to figure it out, less time to jockey personnel on and off the field, less time to make audibles about what the Green Bay Packers offense is doing. So I just did not understand that one bit. And that's the most stunning thing to me about this was the fact that Mike McCarthy came out with the same game plan and did not try to utilize any up-tempo. In either case, one of my recommendations for the Detroit Lions this upcoming week is they're playing the Cleveland Browns. The Cleveland Browns are the second-rated run defense in the league. They had a bye last week. Detroit does not have a consistent run game. At times, I've criticized Jim Bob Cooter for attempting to run the ball a little bit too often, especially in early downs, when this team is far better off passing the ball to set up the run. They're one of the teams that just, they're built to pass the ball. They will not have an efficient run game. It's just not happening for this team with their current personnel. It does not seem like that that is going to be in the cards for them this season. You have uh, you have Abdullah fumbling the ball. Uh, it's just it's just messy. And my advice to the Lions is this: going up against the number two rated run defense and the number. 26 rated pass defense. And that's big because the Detroit Lions, the last several weeks, you can find this up at Chart Football Stats on the Strength of Schedule tab, have played the 12th hardest schedule of opposing pass defenses the last several weeks. They have a massive step down in competition where they get to face the 26th rated Cleveland Browns defense. Cleveland's obviously going to be desperate coming off of a bye, but they still have the same offensive personnel. That's still going to mean a lot of opportunities for this Detroit Lions offense. My advice is throw the ball with Matthew Stafford early and often to build a lead to really demoralize the Cleveland Browns. If Detroit really wants to win and get this game over with, they're going to knock out the underdog Detroit, the underdog Cleveland Browns early in this game. And they're going to do it through the air. They're not going to do it on the ground. I know they want to get the run game going. I know they want to have confidence in that heading into the postseason. Do not make this game about establishing the run. Do not make this game about feeling better about your run. Do not make this game about Amir Abdullah getting back on track. Make this game about a nice, comfortable home win with a passing offense that is humming right now and let them throw the ball in the first half early and often, build and establish that lead, and then run the ball off of that. So that would be my advice for them this upcoming week in their game against the Cleveland Browns on Sunday afternoon. Currently, they're, I think they're like a nine and a half point favorite. Let's discuss one of the largest upsets that we saw this weekend, and that was the Washington Redskins marching into Seattle and winning that game by three points, 17 to 14. Um, that game was an upset because in every single key type of metric, Seattle was dominant um, in overall yards per play, 5.8 to 4.1. In success rate, 48% to 40%. Um, in explosive plays, because success rate obviously measures how frequently you are staying on schedule or ahead of schedule. Um, explosive plays can overtake, you know, 20 yards, 30 yards, and and make up for a lot of times that you don't even have to attempt plays to grade out as successful because you've gained a huge chunk. And Seattle had. Six explosive passes, six explosive runs. The Redskins had one explosive run and four explosive passes. So we're talking a 12 to 5 explosive play advantage for the Seattle Seahawks. Seattle also sacked the Redskins six times. That is extremely, extremely rare for a team to come back and win a game when they were pressured and sacked as much as the Washington Redskins were. Now, there was a uh, the the Seattle Seahawks did lose the turnover battle. They threw two interceptions. Kirk Cousins took care of the football. Did not throw a single interception, although they did have one fumble. Um, but if you look at you know what Russell Wilson was able to do from a passing perspective, um, because he had those two interceptions, 
doesn't look all that great. Um, he didn't have a lot of efficiency. It was kind of rainy a little bit up there in Seattle. Um, a little bit of wind, but you know the, it, this game could have been won by the field goal kicker if he had made the field goals that he missed. I mean, there were several that he totally blew. And I've said this before, but these kickers are fragile beasts. They really are. You you cannot attempt to ride a kicker who has lost their confidence, even if it was for another city at another point in time. It's just not going to work out. These guys are, are fragile beings, and they're not going to, most of them at least, I won't make a blanket statement, but most of them are not going to be able to rebound and perform after that, after their mental state has been shattered. Um, it'll creep back in at different points in time, and it may look great, until there's one specific point in time where you need a couple of kicks and then the mind starts to seep back into a dark place. And that's exactly what we saw with Blair Walsh. And he missed several kicks and just looked like his confidence had been shot all over again. And I know Pete Carroll does a lot of um, sports psychology, positive mind thinking and things of that nature. Um, so maybe that's helped him year to date, but it'll be interesting to see how they rebound off of off of that performance with him. But this is one of those games where, you know, the stats really don't tell the story. This was one of those games where it was just a um a very interesting type of upset last second, you know, deep pass. I mean, the coverage that Seattle was running on that play was not very good. Um and and I will tell you that one, one of the things that should be said, it goes back to the analytics that I'm trying to share at sharpfootballstats.com. One of the things that I mentioned um, when I was breaking down the Washington Redskins offense and their ability to go into Seattle and perform, I gave a massive word of caution against Chris Thompson because Chris Thompson, even if he's used as a receiver, Seattle's metrics as uh, when they defend receivers are tremendous when they defend running backs out of the backfield, like the best in the NFL. And I felt like with the injuries to the Washington offensive line, they were going to have to be throwing the ball a little bit more often to the running back because it's such a quick and short pass. Easy to get out the ball out of Kirk Cousins' hands. You don't have to uh, match up against the defender and make a move at the line of scrimmage or anything like that because the running back is already open to begin with in the backfield. It's just getting him the ball. And sure enough, we saw six targets to Chris Thompson, the second most targeted player on the Redskins apart from Vernon Davis. And what did Chris Thompson do with those six targets? 11 total yards. 11 total yards on six targets. 1.8 yards per pass attempt. So I know that they were probably throwing to him out of desperation type situations where nobody else was open and Kirk was just needed to get the ball out of his hands to avoid a, a negative play like a sack. Um, but definitely no production there. Hopefully you guys didn't roll with Chris Thompson. Um, should be interesting. We've got a Thursday night game this week between the Arizona Cardinals and the Seattle Seahawks. Right now Seattle is favored by five and a half on the road. And That'll be ho hopefully not a horrible game, you know, hopefully not a terrible game to watch, but should be a interesting game because both of these teams desperately need it. Seattle now five and three, Arizona now four and four. Arizona's feeling pretty confident about the run game now that they've got Adrian Peterson there. Um, you know, Rob Kelly ran the ball 14 times, gained 1.3 yards, but he was running the ball behind, gained 1.3 yards per carry rather. But he was running the ball behind a very beat-up offensive line in the Washington Redskins. Arizona's offensive line is not great, but it'd be fascinating to see if they're able to run Adrian Peterson against the Seattle defense um, and what the pass game is able to do without Earl Thomas back there patrolling the secondary. So that'll be fascinating as well. And one last thing to add about the Seattle Seahawks before we move on is the run game. Look, the Eddie Lacy project, this 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 production needs to close up shop and move to another city. Um, if you look at just the statistics for Eddie Lacy, 3.3 yards per carry, you say, well, Thomas Rawls, 4.3 yards per carry. And that's not big of a difference. But that's where 
success rate comes into play because success rate makes up for things that um, yards, average yardage, including yards per play, does not, especially in terms of context. And when you look at the context of this last game, on nine carries, Thomas Rawls posted a 67% success rate. Eddie Lacy on six carries, a 17% success rate. On early downs in particular, which is where Eddie Lacy got all of his carries, on early downs, first down a 33% success rate, and on second down a 0% success rate. Thomas Rawls was 100% successful on first down. Now, I ran some numbers. You can pull these up at sharpfootballstats.com. I went to the situational rushing success rates page by rushers. And you can filter it for first down and 10 yards to go and look at everybody in the NFL, all running backs who have carried the ball at least 25 times on first and 10. You know where Eddie Lacy ranks? He ranks 51st out of 51 players in success rate. You know where he ranks on average yards? 51st out of 51 running backs. The worst in the NFL, he's averaging a 23% success rate on first and 10 runs and 2.2 yards per carry. That is, to tell you how bad that is, that is even worse than Melvin Gordon, who ranks second worst. If it weren't for Eddie Lacy being so terrible, Melvin Gordon, who we all know, I've said this from week one, not good on first down, do not hand the ball off to this guy on first down. And Melvin Gordon ranks 50 out of 51. Eddie Lacy's hanging out there trying to help Melvin Gordon look not as bad as he does. Um, I don't know why they continue to get Eddie Lacy involved. It's his tragedy they lost Chris Carson, but they need to really get rid of Eddie Lacy uh, from the game plan, move on, that ship has sailed, get some efficiency on early downs to keep Russell Wilson from needing to bomb the ball on third down. He still might because he's great at it and the team is set up for some deep shots, but uh, let's let's put him in better situations, more advantageous situations apart from second and long resulting in potentially third and long. All right, let's move on to the Denver Broncos at the Philadelphia Eagles. You know, th there was an issue I had with the play calling from Denver. They went 67% run on early downs in the first quarter. The NFL average is only 54%. And it's unlikely if you're trying to run the ball that much on first or second down that the defense doesn't start to pick up on it and cause some problems. On the court, over the course of the entire day, 19 rushes for the Denver Broncos, 1.8 yards per carry. Now, their defense gave up 5.4 yards per carry to the Philadelphia Eagles. The Eagles are just a machine. The Eagles are an absolute machine right now. And one of the things that I love about the Eagles, I'll digress from Denver for a second, is the fact that they are really using a lot of elements from college and incorporating them seamlessly into the NFL. And that's something that the Kansas City Chiefs were doing for a little while. I haven't seen them doing it quite as recently, quite as, quite as often recently in their games. But the Philadelphia Eagles, they're not changing their entire offense. They're not trotting on new personnel. They're not doing anything crazy and bizarre that you see in college because there's a lot of crazy stuff that you see across the country in college football at times. But they're just incorporating little wrinkles, little motions and formations here or sprint runs there, run pass options, like nothing too extreme, but enough that they can incorporate into this game flow. And the other thing that they have, just like the Kansas City Chiefs had, is a somewhat mobile quarterback. You know, he, he Carson Wentz is more mobile than most of the quarterbacks in the NFL. You know, he's definitely in the top half of mobility. Um, and it's enough that he can run. He's a threat. He can get those free yards. The defense gives you six yards for free on first and 10. And you don't have anything down the field, then take them. And that's what he's capable of doing. But also it's the mobility in the pocket. It's being able to 
sprint right, allow the defense to come to you, and then throw the ball to your running back or a tight end or even a wide receiver who is breaking free down the sideline like we saw in this last game. So it just enables you to do, to do so much. And the thing about the Eagles, I was big on Carson Wentz heading into the season. There were two quarterbacks that a lot of people were sort of writing off because of bad years as rookies. And I was actually more leaning towards optimism with them this year. Carson Wentz and Jared Goff. But the one thing that held me off of doing anything from a futures perspective with regard to the Philadelphia Eagles was their schedule. Their schedule looked to be, I mean, filled with very difficult opponents. Yet, they've been sailing through these games. They've been winning solidly. So it's extremely impressive the way that this team is performing right now. Really looking forward to see how they develop and take on some of these difficult opponents the rest of the way because they're just playing great football right now. Getting back to Denver momentarily, um, I thought they were too predictable on the early downs, especially to start the game, which set them back in a big hole because it was 17-3 to after the first quarter. So, I mean, ostensibly that game is over. It's if if you can't if you can't perform and Philly's scoring like they are, it doesn't the game could go on eight quarters. You're not going to get back if you're getting outscored fourteen points in the first quarter and your offense can't do anything. And obviously what ends up happening is that defense from being out on the field for so long, for seeing their offense turn the ball over, they just get down. I mean it's human nature, they're gonna get disappointed, they're gonna get uh down on themselves, they're going to get ticked off at the offense, and they're not going to be able to play quite as well. And we definitely saw that. We saw that defense just break down and deteriorate over the course of that game. And it's difficult to watch because the defense is good, but defense still is not the same as what it was last year. They're a very good defense, a very good defense, but still not the same as what we've seen from Denver in years past. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not going to get better. It's not going to get better because they keep recycling the same quarterbacks through there. You think the defense is going to get excited if the team announces that Trevor Simeon's the starter next week? You know, I mean, we're not. We're going to go. They've obviously said that Brock Osweiler is their guy. You think they're excited about that? You think they're going to play extra hard because Brock Osweiler is is still the starter? I don't think so. So that's a challenge that they're going to have to battle. But the thing that does bother me is. You know, Brock gets in these post-game press conferences the way that he talks. And, and it, I mean, he talks like he's speaking for the entire team as opposed to speaking for himself. And I don't think the defense would want him representing them. But Brock goes in there and says, we've got to figure out what the problem is. We've got to stop turning the ball over. We've just got to work harder and figure it out. Like, Brock, the problem is you throwing... You're lucky that you only threw two interceptions, throwing these terribly advised passes, third and seven, and you're throwing the ball 25 yards down the field into triple coverage. Like, what are you doing? What are you seeing? The problem is not the rest of the team. It's where you're putting the ball. Now, I'm not saying the team is capable of beating the Philadelphia Eagles, but just a terrible performance and then a refusal to take the blame himself. You know, to say, this is on my shoulders. I did not play good enough. This was my fault this week. I've got no option but to get better, make better decisions, work harder, study harder, come out better next week. But there was none of that. You know, there was, there was we've got to, to figure out what this problem is. This problem has been going on for too long. We've got to figure it out. Guess what? The New England Patriots aren't going to let you figure it out very easily on Sunday night, this upcoming week, and while the New England Patriots have a bye week. But if Brock and that crew turns the ball over, punts the ball three straight times, gives the Patriots the ball at midfield on a couple of possessions, and they start scoring, I mean, that defense, even though they're playing at home, it's going to be hard for them to hang. It's going to be hard for them to feel motivated enough to keep hanging and to keep going out there and grinding. So let's let's hope that Brock can step it up. Stop blaming everybody. Just take it take the burden on yourself and, and do better, Brock. I wanted to get back to something that we had discussed uh, 
on prior pod, and that was returning kickoffs that land in the end zone. And with the starting field position being out at the 25-yard line, I still do not understand why teams continue to run the ball out of the end zone. Watch the games and see this for yourself. You probably are already aware of this phenomenon, but it is absolutely ridiculous. And the metrics backed that up. 538 did a study on this. It proved that teams who try to run the ball out of the end zone end up with an average field position much worse than the average starting field position, which would have been on the 25. And guess what? You know, there's this saying, uh, when you pass, the, when you drop back to pass, like several bad things could happen as opposed to if you're just trying to hand the ball off, you know, minimize the risk there. Well, guess what? If you try to return the ball out of the end zone, three bad things could happen as opposed to just taking a knee and starting on the 25. The first thing is you get tackled well short or even nearly short of the first of the 25 yard line. You might get tackled at the 20. You might get tackled at the 13. Second thing that could happen is that you could fumble the ball. You could botch it and the defense who's coming down could nail you and turn the ball over. The third worst thing is you might have a not a very good uh, return and get a penalty. Holding something, you know, most time it's going to be a holding penalty, backs you back up even further. And you're not going to get a penalty, you're not going to have a turnover, and you're going to start on the 25 if you just kneel on the ball in the end zone. Many, many teams are trying to pin these guys back by kicking the ball that is going to drop right at the end zone, you know, right at the goal line, maybe at the one-yard line, so they have to return it. Don't give those teams the benefit if they mess up and kick it into the end zone. They're trying to make you return it. They want you to return the ball. So if this guy, this kicker, messes up and actually kicks it into the end zone by a yard or two, just kneel on it because guess what? They've practiced time and time again on the kick coverage. They want you to start from the one or the two yard line and they'll tackle you short of the 25. That's their plan. And what do you think is going to happen if now you're starting from three yards into the end zone or four yards into the end zone and trying to return it? The defense now has a five to seven yard extra head start on the coverage team coming down. And if they already have done the math and figured out that, hey, guess what? It's in our best interest to kick the ball down to the three yard line because we'll still tackle you short of the 25 more often than not. Then chances are if you're starting the ball starting with the ball from five yards deep in your end zone, you're not going to make it out to the 25 very often. So why are teams continuing to assist on not coaching their guys to just kneel on the ball? The only time that you would want to run the ball out of the end zone is if you legitimately have like one of two like of the best return men in the league and you've got a great return blocking unit, which most of these teams do not, or in the rare situation where you have no other option, it's desperation time, you need some type of play, you're down by more than a score, and you make you need to make something, to, something happen. Either you don't have enough time in the game to drive it the full length of the field, so you need a head start, or you're in a situation where you're down by multiple scores and you just are hoping that something's going to happen on this return. For the most part, in any point in time in the first half, you should never be returning a kick that the defense that the kicking team screws up and kicks it into the end zone. Yet teams continue to do it all the time, and it's highly, highly frustrating, highly annoying. All right, next up is probably the biggest game of the day, and that was the Dallas Cowboys versus the Kansas City Chiefs. And for this game, you know the the puzzling thing to me is Kareem Hunt's usage, and it's really difficult to understand. Uh, I pretty much think that Andy Reid encountered the same exact situation um, that the Pittsburgh Steelers encountered when they played the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, you're playing against a team that has a very poor run defense. And what ends up happening is you don't have a lot of success early in the game running the football. If you look at what Kareem Hunt did in this game in the first quarter, they handed him the ball four times he gained a total of six yards. Zero of those four were graded out as successful runs. 
and they just ended up going away from him entirely over the game's final three quarters. He had five total carries, and this game was close throughout. It wasn't until the very end that the Dallas Cowboys pulled away by multiple scores. Um, there is absolutely no reason to try to not incorporate Kareem Hunt more frequently. The, this team got more offensive linemen back healthy uh, playing, and I just did not understand that decision to not get Kareem Hunt more involved offensively. If the run game is not working, you have to scheme things that could make it work. You have to try to do some other things. You might have to pass the ball early and deeper down the field. You know, Alex Smith in the first quarter was four or five. Great, 80%. Guess what? Only four yards per pass attempt. He's not throwing the ball down the field. So, of course, you know, the, the defense is going to be able to come up and play you if you're not trying to push the ball down the field. I felt like the Kansas City Chiefs, I mean, they've got a couple weeks here to think about it. They're already focusing on their next opponent. But they're, they headed into their bye, and they came up with this game plan, and it was extremely conservative. It was the type of game plan that we saw from the Kansas City Chiefs in 2016 and in 2015. And if you guys have been following me for a while on the podcast, you know that I was highly critical of the Chiefs because this the style of offense that Kansas City has will not beat good offenses in the playoffs. Good teams with good offenses, their offense was imp- impotent. It was not going to be able to compete against those types of teams. It's not going to be able to go into New England and beat a team like that. It's not going to be able to go into Pittsburgh and beat a team like that. And what we saw them do this year, week one, is get really creative. Cream Hunt even fumbled his first carry, yet they stuck with the run up in New England week one. They passed the ball to the running backs out of the backfield. They had tons of uh, plays schemed up, ready to call. They were being aggressive throwing the ball down the field. Very, very creative game plan, like... Forget the past. This is the new look Kansas City Chiefs. And I feel like heading into their bye this week, they came up with a game plan that was, let's just keep this game close. Let's keep this game close. Let's try to win it in the fourth quarter. Let's not make any mistakes early. We don't want to give Dallas the ball back. And it was like this concern over a turnover potentially, concern over being efficient, uh, being too aggressive that caused them to focus on small ball in the passing game. And they should have stuck more with the run. They should have passed the ball deeper down the field. They should have been a little bit more aggressive and urgent from the beginning. And I really don't understand. I just, uh, I just don't think it works in the NFL consistently to approach a team who has a good offense, especially when you don't have a good offense, and not be ultra-aggressive ultra from the start. If your defense is bad, you cannot just sit there and try to matriculate the ball down the field, converting multiple third downs, and just hope that everything on this drive goes smooth sailing for you so that you can kick a field goal at some point. Like It's not going to help. It's not going to win games. And too often, we saw the Kansas City Chiefs get very, very conservative I mean, they on the third their third drive in the first quarter they punted the ball from you know the Dallas Cowboys 42 yard line. They were at the 20 and they kicked a field goal. You know they it wasn't until that obviously that final play of the almost the final play it was the final play actually of the first half, and then they actually had a a nice five first down drive to start the second half where they got a little bit more aggressive threw the ball around a little bit more and and had a lot more balance, got some penalties in their favor and, and trekked from their own 38. They got a nice return down and scored a touchdown. And that's it. I mean, after that, that, that singular drive where that looked good, the rest of their drives, I mean, they, they just... They got to the opponent's 43 and threw an interception kind of in desperation time. They got to the uh, opponent's 20, kicked a field goal. Got to the opponent's 42, punted the ball. I mean, and when you factor in like no downfield passing or at least a lack thereof, 
We're not going to give Kareem Hunt enough touches on the ground. It's just not a formula to work. So hopefully they get some things figured out. Hopefully they get back on track in the bye week. But I will tell you, if you look at their schedule throughout the course of the rest of the season, this is a team they got away from Kareem Hunt tonight. They have to go back to Kareem Hunt. Their next opponent's coming up in terms of run defense. Rank 24th, that's the Giants week 11. They play one good run defense week 12. That's the Buffalo Bills, but they get to play them in Kansas City. Then they play the 18th rated Jets run defense, the 23rd rated Raiders run defense, and the 26th rated Chargers run defense. Over their next five games, four of the run defenses rank below average, several in the bottom 10. They absolutely have to get Kareem Hunt back involved heavily in their game plan, pass off of that, throw the ball to Kareem Hunt out of the backfield, stay aggressive, and not try to rely so much on your defense. Unfortunately, many of these offenses that they play, at least the first three weeks, not very good. The Giants offense, the Bills offense, the Jets offense. Adequate in some cases, but not great, not very good, not the type of offenses that Kansas City is going to be fearing when they go to the playoffs and ultimately lose, like an op to an offense like the Patriots, like an offense um, like the Cowboys or the Steelers, offenses that are capable of scoring the ball. That's the times that Kansas City needs to get aggressive, needs to go. So they can easily get more run heavy, focus on what they do the next three weeks, but they have to get back that aggressive nature, um, get the lead, and then run the ball a little bit more often. Wanted to talk a little bit about totals in terms of uh, what the Vegas, uh, you know, what sports books are posting on these games. So far this season, this this sounds crazy because if you look at the board right now, you go to sharpfootballanalysis.com, you can click on the lines tab, you can look at all the lines for the games. You look at the board right now, and there's just one game that's actually totaled above 46, 46 and a half. And that's the Dallas Atlanta game. That's the only game right now that's totaled above 46 or 46 and a half. And and we're sitting here. It's 2017. This was you know offenses production. We're seeing so many games that are totaled. I mean, I'll just go down the board: 41 and a half, 42 and a half, 45, 41, 40 and a half. I mean, and then there's a couple others that are between 41 and a half and 42 and a half. And there's a 39 and a half. Uh, it's just really, really low numbers. These offenses and their production, you know, they're looking at. I mean, we've got Ryan Fitzpatrick starting games. Um, there's just so many different backup quarterbacks who are now starting games in the NFL, and quarterbacks make a major difference. I mean, if you don't have a good quarterback, you're going to struggle. Um, and so these offenses aren't looking as good against the defenses. But I wanted to share with you this interesting statistic um, based upon these lines. We've had one week so far this year. One. We're sitting here. This includes week 10. One out of the first 10 weeks where the average total, the average total, actually, I'm sorry, week one was there as well. But since week one, where the average total was above 45 points. Week one, the average total was 45.8, and week six, the average total on all the games you know that are playing that week was 45 and a half. Every single other week was 45 or below. Compare that to 2016, just last year, where through the first 14 weeks of the season, the first 14 weeks of the season, the average total was never. 45 or below in any of those 14 weeks. It wasn't until we got some weather involved that week 15 had an average total of set at 44. And the rest of them throughout the playoffs, I mean, sorry, throughout the rest of the regular season, week 16 and week 17, those were also set on average above 45. So one out of 17 weeks last year was the average total posted on these games even set at 45 or below. And so far this year, through 10 weeks, we've had only two weeks where the average total was set above 45. So that, that's, that's pretty remarkable. It tells you the story of what the, 
this is not just what the odds makers are saying. When I say set, I, I actually mean what the total is on Sunday. So obviously these totals get bet around, higher or lower. I don't mean the opening line. I mean a line that's close to the closing line. It might not be the exact perfect closing line, but it's a line from Sunday morning. And on average, so that's the influence of the, the sports book as they're setting the number, and then the bettors as they're betting into it. And collectively, between those two universes, it just shows you how much down the projection, this doesn't have anything to do with what actually happens, but the projection of the caliber of the offenses compared to the defenses this year versus last year, and just how much lower our expectations are for these games, and, and, and the product on the field is in many cases mirroring that. All right, a couple more, and then uh, then we'll wrap this up. Uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the Houston Indianapolis game. Um, if you got cast, the one play that uh, that I suggested there from DFS perspective was getting Jacoby Brissett in there. Um, very low ownership, very low price, but I felt like everybody was overestimating uh, what this Houston Texans team would look like with Tom Savage, and I thought that there was going to be a lot of value. Uh, in taking Jacoby Brissett, and I thought that he was going to have a lot of success throwing the ball mid-level to Jack Doyle and then deeper to T.Y. Hilton. Um, and obviously we know he he actually exceeded 300 yards passing against this defense, 123 passer rating, two touchdowns. Um, Jack Doyle, highly efficient, 56% um, success rate on his targets. And then T.Y. Hilton, 175 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, so a great day from, from both of those guys. But the bigger story here uh, to me is just the drop-off from Deshaun Watson to Tom Savage. I mean, it, it, it could not be fully accounted for in that spread. Um, and it, it obviously wasn't. And that's the reason I took, even though the line had dropped down to seven, um, you put Tom Savage in front of me, uh, there's just no chance. There's just... just just no chance. Um, even against it, even with a defense as bad as Indianapolis is, is there's just no chance. The first quarter of that game, okay, when the scripting should be down, when the most optimal time to throw the ball against this defense, Tom Savage, four of twelve for two point eight yards per pass attempt, a forty two passer rating, and only a seventeen percent success rate on twelve passes. 12 passes, 34 yards. Just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Um, they couldn't do anything against this defense. And it has nothing to do, I mean, no disrespect, but it doesn't have anything to do with this Colts defense. This Colts defense wasn't the cause of that. They played great. Ultimately, they were the beneficiary of having faced Tom Savage in this game. He's a terrible quarterback. I know Evan, talked to Evan today. He, he had some uh, a lot less um, cordial words to share about Tom Savage and his capabilities as an NFL quarterback. So we'll see what the future holds. I mean, Houston cannot stick with this guy. He is not a starting caliber quarterback. I don't even care if he's your backup. He's just so bad. And I also don't understand, and, and I'm not calling the play, so I don't know exactly if it's designed for this or not, but why these young, inexperienced quarterbacks continue to try to attempt to throw the ball to the extreme boundaries of the football field, leaving their receivers no wiggle room to adjust to the football if they're slightly off target. Think about this for a second. Let's say you want to throw the ball 13 yards down the field. Okay, you, You've got a target who's 13 yards down the field. If you throw the ball over the middle of the field, this, this player could catch the ball if it's two yards to the left, two yards to the right. He could adjust forwards or back. I mean, there's like a, a radius of how he could catch that ball. If you, throw, if you target this guy 13 yards down the field, but standing on the sideline for a tiptoe catch, you, you can't be too high because his feet are sort of have to be planted there. If, if, if you try to make him walk backwards, you know, he's facing the quarterback, walk backwards up the field, probably going out of bounds. You also can't be too short because, again, he's going to be going out of bounds. 
you, you and you definitely can't be too far to the outside because the pass is, is out of bounds. So it li limits the amount of inaccuracy from the quarterback that will allow a completion, let alone the fact that it's a further distance pass, let alone the fact that these are passes that are more easily interceptable. And and you you got a guy like DeAndre Hopkins out there. I mean, the kid is just, he's jump the ball is like thrown 10 feet over his head on these sideline routes, and he's still giving effort to jump up and try to show you that he's willing to try to make the effort to extend. But this happens over and over and over again. You know, there's, there's, it's just bad. It's, I don't understand why the coaches and the, the, the quarterbacks aren't scheming up and trying to target the guys running the routes over the middle of the field where they are easier to target. It's a shorter distance pass and it's a high, it's a more successful pass. The NFL averages show the throwing the ball over the short middle of the field is the most optimal place to target. And yet we still see guys like Tom Savage throwing the ball to the extreme edges and boundaries of the football field. And last but not least, guys, I want to talk to you about a different topic, uh, a new visualization up at sharpfootballstats.com. I rolled this out last week. Didn't have a chance to talk about it on the Monday podcast. But if you go to go to sharpfootballstats.com, go under the offensive tab, scroll down to efficiency slash success, and go down to trending performance. You're able to pull up the trending performance for offenses where you can see what they've done year to date as well as what they've done during a certain trend period that you want to select. So you could select, for instance, week seven through nine in the trend period, and you will see where this team ranks season long versus what they've done the last those last three weeks, week seven, eight, and nine. And if you hover over each um, ranking, you'll see their actual success rates or explosive play rates. So I've got it segregated out. It shows you passing success rate, rushing success rate, explosive passing, and explosive rushing. And in all four of those categories, it'll have a column for a season long and a column for your trend period. So you can see how they do. And guess what, guys? The trending performance for the Jacksonville Jaguars, the second best success rate weeks seven through nine for passing and the fifth most explosive passing team, week seven through nine. Those rankings move up from season long, their 15th in successful passing rate up to number two, and season long, their 19th in, in explosive passing rate up to number five. If the Jaguars are able to get their passing game going in addition to this run game, in addition to their schedule, which I was commenting on their schedule before the season even started in the 2017 preview, about how they face an easy schedule of opposing teams. Teams that aren't supposed to have very good years, they face the easiest. And so we said Leonard Fournette is in a great position to have success. Jacksonville's got to make intelligent play calls, um, you know, but I felt like they were in a great position to have Leonard Fournette have success. If they can get this passing game going as well, scary team. Another team that's been trending really well from an explosive passing perspective was the Detroit Lions. And I don't even have the Monday night game in there because it just finished. But they had a couple explosive passes to Jones in that game and also um, uh, Tate. But they rank number two in explosive passing. Year to date, they were 17th. Now they rank number two. So they've made a big jump. And a third team that's made a big jump that I want to note to you guys is the Chicago Bears. We know that this season started with Glennon, then they moved in Trubisky, but they were having him run the ball a lot. They were having, uh, the, you know, they were having a high run rate, which I expect to continue. They are having other guys throw the ball down the field. Well, Trubisky started to throw the ball a little bit more down the field against the Saints, and I'm eager to see what they do this week against the Green Bay Packers because, as we know and have seen, unless Mike McCarthy wisens up and does a little bit more no huddle and hurry up this upcoming game, if you're playing against the Packers while they've got Hundley in there, you might have some good opportunities on offense to perform. And this defense of the Packers is worse than what you expect. So if Hundley can get things going a little bit offensively, sorry, if Trubisky can get things going through an explosive passing perspective, 
open things up even more for their run game. Um, that that could be that could be definitely big. So I'm looking forward to seeing how Trubisky looks coming out of his bye, and I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing Mike McCarthy go with a little bit more up tempo strategy. I know they're playing on the road in Chicago, but it's a familiar place. They need to do that. They need to go up tempo a little bit more. Let it let um, the young quarterback. Brett Hundley, throw the ball a little bit more down the field. Start off the game a little bit more aggressive. Play to win. Don't play not to lose. And that, that's the strategy. All right, guys, that'll wrap it up for this edition of the Monday Night Podcast from Sharp Football Analysis Podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys learned a little bit. Um, be sure to check me out on Twitter, at Sharp Football. Check Evan Silva out on Twitter, at Evan Silva. You can catch my work up at sharpfootballstats.com. Tons of free statistics, visualized data, lots of things that you're not going to find at any other website out there, including personnel groupings that are fully filterable and are updated frequently throughout the course of the season. So you can check out what formations your teams are using, where they're most successful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, check out sharpfootballanalysis.com for my in-season projections and weekly predictions. Check out Evan Silva up at rotoworld.com. He does a great matchups article that comes out every single Thursday evening uh, that'll get you set with the fantasy perspective for the upcoming week. Um, So from Evan and myself, thanks for tuning in to this edition of the show. We'll be back on Friday night where we're breaking down some games for the upcoming weekend, discussing some matchups, discussing some players that we feel are underrated and possibly overrated. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, guys, good luck with your research. Hope you have a great week, and we'll catch you later. You do know we on National TV, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought it was just on FaceTime. I was telling them my picture. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>